DJ, you want to kick us off with introductions? Sure. My name is TJ Myhill. I'm an attorney at Stites and Harbison here in Atlanta. Uh, I deal with internet and technology law issues all the time, uh, and I'm here to speak on the legal perspective. I'll let the smarter people handle the technology sides, but uh, any of the legal issues I will be happy to address. All right. I am Andrew Greenberg. I've been a game developer in Georgia since 1990. I am the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association, and I've worked for Virtual Worlds. I've worked on MMOs, uh, been involved in all these, and uh, certainly been involved with plenty of folks who are all excited about Web 3.0. All right. And I'm Nathan White. I've been coming, I think this is my sixth year at DragonCon, my fifth year speaking at the EFF. Uh, the third different organization that I've represented. I <laughs> used to come here on behalf of Access Now, an international human rights organization that fe focuses on tech policy. And about four years ago, I was recruited by a little company called Facebook to come advise on building our augmented reality and virtual reality platforms, devices, hardware, and software. And so I've been with Meta Reality Labs for the last four years was initially an advisor on all things augmented reality, virtual reality, and the whole spectrum. In the last couple of years, as we've got more products and grown and the world has become more familiar with those, we've, we've hired a few more people. And now I lead our augmented reality policy team. That's about seven people who are working on building uh, augmented reality glasses and all of the policy that comes into that. That's policies of what data we're allowed to use, how the hardware works, how the infrastructure works, what policies are for when the light has to come on, that a camera's on, and then also all of the subs, all of the additional policies of how we work within the company. So I've had a front row seat in helping to build the metaverse for the last few years, at least for a company that calls itself Meta. <laughs> uh, so it's a subject that I find endlessly exciting and very interesting. However, one of the things that I find, nobody has any idea what the metaverse is. You ask 10 people, we're going to hear 10 different things. 11. 11. Let's go for 15. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask my fellow panelists to uh, explain what they think the metaverse is, but to make sure that we are including the audience, I'm going to ask the audience first. Does anybody want to stand up and give us a definition? What is the metaverse? <laughs> and give us an intro an introduction for yourself too. Uh Yatin Manga, uh finance manager for global payments, uh just uh here to get an, a feel of what metaverse is. So to answer your question, it's a combination of virtual reality uh and augmented reality. That's my perception of it. But at the same time I also want to get a more defined definition of what exactly the metaverse is. Well, Mr. Mr. Lawyer, you, you can, can you define, is there a legal definition somewhere in the statute? <laughs> nope. <laughs> I will tell you that the metaverse is where... Sorry, Scott, do you need something? Technology has gone way faster than the law can keep up. <laughs> well, I, I will, I will uh, admit that I... Uh, I was probably about 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, a friend of mine uh, told me about a book called Snow Crash. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think that really is where it, where it originally came from. And one of the defining qualities of the metaverse is I think it really does require goggles. It requires that you have to have something over your eyes. I guess we have virtual worlds now that don't require goggles, like Second Life. But the question, I guess the question for, in my mind is, does it really require uh, something covering your eyes to, to be the metaverse? So I argue... Crap, I'm in the metaverse. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I argue that Ro Roblox has to be considered part of the metaverse. I argue that Fortnite has to be considered part of the, of the metaverse. The meta, I'm talking about metaverse from the Snow Crash example, it was basically all of these different things coming together into one sort of entity. From, um, But I, I go much, much broader. I mean, basically, I see meta as 50% of what we used to call, and I hate this term too, cyberspace, because it really is community focused. And this is what folks are trying to do who call themselves Web 3.0 proponents and want to build into the metaverse. It is how we bring different communities together to interact and how people will get their social needs filled in a virtual setting. And that is Fortnite, that is Roblox. You can't leave these out of it if you're talking about a universe where people are gonna hang out that is meta in the sense that you've got lots of different components to it. Hey guys, um, thank you for doing this. 
Um, I was wondering, maybe it would be instructive to talk about some things that the metaverse is not. So things I would consider in the metaverse would be cryptocurrency, digital real estate, uh, virtual reality, maybe even like Facebook and MySpace back in the day. But like, would stuff like that be considered part of the metaverse? Or maybe you could say some things that are technology but not part of the metaverse. So uh, that, that's a fascinating question. I, I think one of the ways to define the metaverse is an era and how we interact with computers. That it is not a set of technologies, it is not virtual reality, it is not AR plus VR. I think of it as being an era of how we interact with computers. That going back from Xerox PARC, most of us know computers as a thing that you interact with through a graphical user interface. You've got a mouse, you've got a keyboard, that's how we interact with computers. Then we all got smartphones and computers started being in our pocket and we could access that during this, during whenever you wanted. You had email, we started to get mobile apps, you could search for information. Then there was another era where we all got really good cameras and you could start to interact. Rather than just read the newspaper, we could have web 2.0. But in the future, our primary way of accessing that information is probably not going to be a phone that we pull out of our pocket. It's going to be glasses that interlay information over us. The difference is the computers see the world the way that we see. They are not reliant on us for input. They use forward-facing cameras and forward-facing sensors to see the world, observe the world, and augment our experience. The way that we interact with computers will be completely different. Hopefully, in really immersive ways that are very useful. You can use your hands, you can use your eyes, you can use your voice. It is easier and you don't have to learn how to type. Lots of exciting things. But when we get to that kind of a period where we all have AR glasses, we're checking our email on AR, we're getting turn-by-turn -turn directions for AR. Every once in a while, we dive into a VR environment for more immersive or for a shopping experience. What do we call that era of computing? That's not Web 2.0. That is something completely different that our relationship with machines change. And to me, that's what I think of when the metaverse. And that's not a thing that you go to. It is our lives and it is the world around us. And it's a completely new era. And I call it our relationship with computers. We've been developing that relationship for 50, 60 years. And the next 20 years are going to be super fascinating. There are technologies that aren't necessary to make that happen. So a lot of telcos are building out 5G networks and they talk about how 5G is necessary for the metaverse. 5G makes a lot of things really helpful and useful and you can do edge computing and you can get faster information, but it's not necessarily necessary. The blockchain, lots of interesting things that you could do, but you can still do AR, VR, you can still do lots of things with it. So I wouldn't, use, I wouldn't say that there are things that are not part of the metaverse, I think of it as more of a spectrum of technologies that we're all going to interact with and become more comfortable with, and it's more about defining that era. Well, then I'll actually throw the question to you. What do we have right now that defines that era? What's a good example right now that defines that era? So I think one of the things that is really going to turn for us, that is going to be the change, is immersion. And there, you really feel that with, with VR and some degree of the AR experiences that exist out, out there. But when you put on a VR headset, you feel like you are there. If you are up on a ledge, you feel it in the pit of your stomach that your brain is telling you this is dangerous. If somebody's next to you, you're going to feel their presence next to you. And in some VR, it's relatively early days for that. But that is, I think, the defining characteristic of what the new the new era is going to be. And within that, we're going to build lots and lots of worlds and lots of ways to have immersive connections with people. And I think absolutely Roblox, Fortnite, Pokemon Go, these kind of experiences that we can experience today are going to be the first experiences that people have with these new technologies to immerse it. When you, you build programs and hardware and software, we talk about the first charge of somebody buys a new device, you buy a new phone, you buy a new tablet. What is somebody going to do with that the very first time they turn it on, with the very first charge before they plug it in? Look at porn. <laughs> Play a game. Uh, well, it's, it, exactly. Play a porn game. I, th I think you're right. People don't buy a new device and do something they've never done before. You buy a new computer, the first thing you do is put your email on it. You put your accounts on it. You check your email. When somebody buys AR glasses, might be the first time you've ever had AR glasses. It's not going to be a new thing that you've never done before. It's going to be something that you're familiar with in a more immersive way. Uh, hi, my name is David Hutcherson, and I'm 
37, back when I was in college, we were de dealing with AR and glasses and such to show that kind of stuff. And we're talking, that's like early, early to mid 2000s. Some of this technology has been around for a while. And you mentioned stuff like Pokemon Go and new ways of interaction. And I would like to argue that none of the stuff that we're doing right now that's kind of caught on is really new. It's not even new in a sense that it was catching on for a while now, like Virtual Boy was virtual reality headset. Mm -hmm. And moreover to the point that I'm trying to get towards, like with Pokemon Go, they couldn't re replicate that with Wizards, the Wizard program where they have the, where that was. That died because the IP was not big enough. And a lot of the AR stuff that I saw back when I was going up had practical applications, but a lot of limitations with uh, the physical reality of stuff. Like it's very hard to get any kind of great deal of in information onto glasses. Mm -hmm. As well as virtual headsets have the inherent problem of, yeah, sure, you may feel that, but I kind of feel the edge, uh, being on the edge of a cliff while playing a regular video game mm -hmm. right. without a headset. But you're, you have a headset covering up your peripherals and you're using motions to move around and, you know, last Dragon Con, I had my nephew watching a house, the virtual headset broke the TV. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of these problems there. Do you foresee this actually being something, a stopgap or, or something that we're, that, that we are looking at dealing with Wait, right now? You got to remember the computer existed a whole lot longer than it's been on people's desks. This is and it, it existed on people's desks a whole lot longer than it has existed in our pockets. And it was it's a question of adoption. It's a question of usability. When a computer is the size of the ha of your house, you can't have one in your house. When a computer gets smaller and it can do more things and it becomes useful and it has useful programs, accounting programs, word processor programs, things a home user wants, then a home user will buy it. And when smartphones came out, you know, there wasn't really a need for it, but once you started to be able to do things on it that the consumer wanted, people bought them and now they're everywhere so i mean did, did did people buy the first augmented reality glasses like 10 people right because it wasn't it wasn't something that was useful to the general purchasing public so as things grow you're going to get that adoption the 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 adoption comes with the creation of the technology and the content that people want to pay the price of entry right and i think nathan was uh, kind of implying about that there's an evolutionary nature to this that, I mean, you do get the first steps and it grows and grows. My first experience with VR goggles was in 92. And I said, well, this will be great someday, but sure as hell it wasn't right then. Uh, and it, it is dramatically different now, but it's still not generally adopted. I mean, uh, I have friends who've sold very well into the VR communities with their games, and they tell me that means we sold nothing compared to what our normal games sell, uh, even though they were massive success within the community. So uh, we are going to continue to see this evolutionary nature of it. I mean, uh, my friends who consider Web3 to be metaverse and everything Web3 is metaverse uh, talk about Web1 where your websites are just shouting at people. People are coming up there. There's nothing for them to do except get shouted at. Web2.0, <laughs> oh, suddenly there's stuff for them to do. Web3.0 oh, is now there's a place for you to be. And they are the ones who point to the idea of Roblox. I mean, when we're talking about the value of digital real estate, your place in Roblox, there are some folks that's incredibly valuable right now. Uh, I think that. Is it though? <laughs> if someone buys them, it's sure as heck, <laughs> then it's bringing them a lot of money. Yep. Well, yeah, no, it, 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 that, that's. So. Oh, now we're going to talk is it really valuable as right. opposed to just making money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great it's argument, valuable great right argument. now, right, right now, for sure. Yeah. But the question is, you know, we, we've dealt with real property for centuries. Mm -hmm. I know how to sell a piece of land, and that piece of land will always be there and it will always have some value just because there's land and digital land is not Ephemeral. land yeah it can go away you it, think it, zeros so. and ones don't have value they have a lot of value to the right people <laughs> and at the right time I, it just it, it's a it's a that's the that's the interesting legal question right we we've been dealing with this when a, a decade ago when lawyers first learned about second life Wow, there were articles, there were books. I wrote one of them about uh, about how to how you were going to own the, what to do with this, how we're going to structure this, what the what the legal ramifications were going to do. Look at all the legislation that has been formed about Second Life. 
meanwhile, you know, there's probably ten new laws about owning real property that come out, you know, this week. So it, it's a it's a it's a question. Like I said, the metaverse is an area where the use and technology outpaces the law, and trying to keep up with how we make that protection and create that those rights and those those ownerships and and how we handle ownership of things that might just one day disappear if somebody kicks the plug wrong and that you don't even <laughs> own because really Roblox owns your space in Roblox right even if you are monetizing it yeah so, so I, I want to want to call on you but this is I actually disagree with you on this that one of the valuable things I think about is digital ownership is that it allows you to own something beyond the company that you're in that I work for Meta and we're going to build all sorts of interesting things that you're going to be able to do. If we build, I don't know, an avatar so you can look how you want to look. If we build a facial or a codec avatar so you look photorealistic to who you are, does that only exist in our walled garden? Maybe. But that's not interoperability. That's not fun. That's not the way the World Wide Web works. We need interoperability. But if you have a digital ownership, something like the blockchain or a Web 3.0 or an NFT and where you can say, I own this thing and I'm going to bring it to your platform because I want to exist on your platform. But when I'm going to another platform, I want to bring it over there too. Mm. That I want to exist wearing my clothes, my outfit, my identity when I meet somebody in a meta real space versus an Apple space. Right now, there's no way to do that. You right. can't bring something from a Facebook like, you can't bring something from Blue App Facebook to an Apple, though they don't have a social network. Uh, but you can't you, take Roblox you, you can to Fortnite. You can copy it, but you can't bring something as personal right. as a photorealistic avatar that is my digital identity. Right. That is incredibly valuable because it opens up and allows you to say, I want to go to this platform, but mm -hmm. I'm not owned by this platform. That also enables third-party creators and other people who are not big global companies who can put billions of dollars into this to have a piece of it, to be able to build something, to be, I'm an artist, or I, I just came from a panel on the Crew Shadows who have been coming from <laughs> Dragon Con since 1993 mm -hmm. or something like that. They have a huge fan base here. They want to be able to come here. They sell their t-shirts. They have their booth over in the Marriott. That allows them to be able to participate in what is the, the beginning of the metaverse so that it's not just companies like mine who can build it and profit from it. Uh, let me keep going with that. Oh, this is a great sorry. part. Yeah, 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 and, and the segue on that, um, I'm really glad you said third-party creatorship because that was exactly the nature of my question, is um, what are some of the legal difficulties of creating yeah. things in the metaverse? For example, as a non-metaverse example, I've made software on my company computer that I don't own any IP of. It's very valuable, but I own nothing of it because I made it on their computer. If I was to make something that other people used in the metaverse or in any other kind of VR environment, but I made it on someone else's platform, what kind of rights do I have as the creator of that, or does it all belong to the people that own the actual space? And it goes beyond that. So if you want to talk about interoperability, I'm not even going to talk about the technical challenges involved in that, which are insane. Uh, the legal challenges of going from EULA to EULA is maddening. So yeah, your question is exactly spot on, TJ. Well, and the, <laughs> and the answer to your question is, what does your contract say? Because all of this is contracts. Every single bit of digital rights, digital ownership is contract-based right now. Because we don't have statutes. We don't have years of, of case law that has formed an analysis. What we have is, what does your EULA say? Or if you're making it on a work computer, what does your employment contract say? What does it say about work for hire? What does it say about assignment of rights? What does it say about intellectual property rights? Because maybe you own it, you created it. If you created it, and it's copyrightable, you're immediately the owner, unless your contract says you're not. <laughs> so, so that's the that's the key. The the, the 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 legal answer to every question you're going to ask tonight is, what does your contract say? And when you're dealing with cross-platform things, right? Yes, Facebook Meta can create a a, a contract, a EULA that allows you to do these things. But does Roblox and and, 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 and Fortnite then allow you to import them. What does their EULA say? What is that? So we've got we got a lot of ground to work out, and none of it is defined by any type of overarching rule of law. There is no there is no one ring to rule them all here. This is this is absolutely free game. What's your contract say? And I'll throw another one into you. Think about how trademarks are very specifically applied or broadly applied depending on how you've registered. Now think if you've created something within one 
portion of the metaverse in, in Facebook and Meta, and you want to take it somewhere else, and someone else already has that there mm-hmm. and is monetizing it there. Is that trademark for all metaverse? Is it going to be specific specific platforms? Mm-hmm. So uh, well, and then you got to look at the fun. you got to look at the what 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 goods and or services are you using for your trademark? So the lawyers in the audience should hear lots of job opportunities <laughs> for the next ten years, lots of work, yeah. job security. <laughs> you, you have a question, comment? Yeah. Um, so and who are you? One. Oh, my, my name is Emmanuel Peters. Uh, I'm a lead cloud software engineer at Productive Cloud. So, my question is more so, um, giving your uh, definition of the metaverse, it seems to me more the mixture of the physical and the digital. It's not just the place that we will go to in the future, right? It's, it's if that upon that definition, then can you expound just a little bit more of um, the role that you foresee Facebook having with that, Apple and other companies in terms of the creation, because one of you guys said like the, um, the port, basically the porting over of data. Ultimately, the avatar is just data. So, uh, data compatibility between Apple and Google and things like that. So, um, to make sure my question is clear, what, in the new definition that's been Proposed new as defined by for, for the layperson <laughs> me. Um, what is Facebook's role? Where are they going? And um, and how does the porting over are they solving the, are they solving the problem of the data um, incompatibilities between platforms? For example, yeah. So uh, computers have been evolving for a really long time. I'm I'm reading a fascinating book right now called The Dream Machine about a guy named like something who started the ARPA research project in the and he started doing research as early as the 30s and 40s about computers and networking and how we would interact with them. They didn't build computers with the idea of they'll be old clunky machines. They built computers with these grand visions of they would do interesting things and they've evolved over time. The first computers were very simple. They were crunch numbers. They could do th- do calculations over time. We had to interact with them by telling them exactly what to do. One of the first major breakthroughs was being able to network those computers so everybody could people could have a terminal that would process on that main machine, but it would still do pretty clunky math of just put in input, give me this output. There was, I think, what was about the 60s, 70s, there was a really famed research park called Xerox Park out in Silicon Valley that was run by the Xerox Corporation that just did a whole bunch of research into how do we actually make computers work for people? They really invented the concept of the personal computer, which took another couple of decades to build, but they were the ones who were studying to do develop of how do we make a computer work the way that humans work? How do we make it so anybody can access this? They were the ones who developed the graphical user interface to be able to use a mouse on a screen to click on something. The idea of you click on something or you drag something or you type something was revolutionary of suddenly you didn't need years and years and years of education to use a computer. It was relatively intuitive. You could pick up the basic concepts fairly quickly. Fun aside, that's actually why Solitaire and Minesweeper are on computers to teach people how to use computers for point and slip. It wasn't they were designed for fun. They were there to teach you how to use it. Then computers got more and more easy to use, more immersive, or more human-centric, that humans could use them to do human things. But until mobile phones and until smartphones, you still, computers were very, very, you tell me what to do, I'm going to do all the processing to give you what you want, but kind of dumb that they were learning what we wanted them to do. We got things like what you see is what you get kind of text editors, which were way better than having to print a book before they existed, but they were still just programs that were doing what we wanted them to do. Cell phones, the, to your point about what's changed, there's nothing new under the sun, but the things that have really changed that have made technology, made so much of Silicon Valley think this time it's going to happen, first of all, is cell phones. Cell phones, billions of them around the world, made computer chips much, much faster, much, much smaller. These things have more processing power than you could believe. Um, the first AR VR uh, headset being designed by Apple is rumored to have their M1 chip, which is insanely fast. It's just incredible that you can put that in there. 
couple of days ago, we announced we're partnering with Qualcomm that we're going to start co-developing chips specifically with Qualcomm and make them available specifically for AR and VR. So that the miniaturization of technology was a huge factor and that what you had in 1992 probably didn't track your environment very well, probably had latency, and it probably made you really sick, yep. which is why Nintendo, the VR boy, was just unpleasant to use. You remember a few years ago, you had these that you put your cell phone in a box, and it was unpleasant to use. Now, if you put on a Quest 2, it might take a minute to get your sea legs, but the technology is just profoundly different because it's miniaturized and it's smaller, it's lightweight, we can do processing, we don't have to tie to a big computer. The next big development is computer vision, that thanks to AI machine learning, computers see the world now. They can process the world in ways that we, we don't even really think about. So Quest 2 has cameras on it called simultaneous location and mapping that map your environment so that they know where you are at all times in the position so that you don't get sick, so you can wave around, so you can do whatever you want. Those cameras see your environment and process your environment. Those cameras that are on Quest 2 are the very, very, very like early days of what machine vision can do. We are already so, so, so far beyond that. We can, with a phone, with this LiDAR scanner right here, that's why I got the new Apple 13, that they have the LiDAR scanner, I can scan any physical object and import it into a computer. I can have ongoing cameras, like on your Tesla, if you have a Tesla, that can monitor your situation and have enough machine learning that they can predict what you're going to do, they can parallel park, they can drive your car, they can do all sorts of incredible things. And so the computer vision is really what's changed that makes, well, first of all, the development of miniaturization that we can fit that much processing power into something that will fit on your face and we've got batteries small enough that it won't burn your face because when you process things get heat but then the computer vision of the computers see the world the way that you do and interpret it in a way that is immersive for you and intuitive to you you don't need to learn how to even point and click if i look and say yeah i want that and i don't even have to do that i can do this and fun fact, when I do this, I can read the machine readable signals at your hand because your muscle is actually sending an electrical signal when it moves. I can read that and determine you are pinching, you are moving, you are doing this. We've got, we call it EMG electromyography. We're developing systems that will be able to read that. And the really fun fact, you, your brain will send an electrical signal to do this even if you don't do this, even if you just think about it. Yeah. So I can look and say, I want to click on that, and it clicks. That requires intuitive. It, it does not require any training. It does not learn anything to point and click or use a mouse. It knows what I'm trying to do and gives it to me in an immersive way. And so I think that unlocks just an incredibly new era where it's not us telling computers, do this function because I want something directly out. It's assist me. Do what I want you to do. Help me do things that I may not even want I realize that I want you to do. If I can't hear somebody in the back and I'm looking at you and the system can know that I'm paying attention to you, it can mute out the rest of the voice and focus just on you and I can bring up your volume and so I can hear you. I don't have to do anything for that to happen. The system can pick up, that's my intent. That's pretty cool. That's a new era of our relationship with computers. <laughs> now I have to start thinking about how all this can go wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so, oh. So I've, I've used the brain controller thing about 95 was the first time I used one where they just hook it up to your brain. So there's a little rocket and I'm thinking up, 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 it goes up. As soon as I stop thinking up, 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 it starts coming down. I think up, up, up again, it starts going. So yeah, this is the way we've seen it coming is it's coming. And um, the technology, I've, I've even seen good, easy technology for interoperability. I used to, uh, there was a group that came here about a decade ago that was trying to create items you could take between games. And really, it was primarily API and art, but then no one would adopt it to bring it on in. So, I mean, the, the items had no functionality. They were purely cosmetic. But there was the ability to do that. Now, when you want them to function, that's a huge amount of, um, that's more than just a simple API that's going to allow them to have, carry the same function between different platforms and different parts of, uh, of the metaverse. And that's something I'm still waiting to see happen. However, then you've got the idea of property which interoperability is exactly what you don't want with that. If uh, you buy 
digital property next to Snoop Dogg's property, it's valuable because it's next to Snoop Dogg's property. You don't want him to move, and you don't want to move. And that was, I think, one of the most uh, valuable pieces of uh, digital land that sold was the land next to Snoop Dogg. So it's really f it's fascinating, especially since you're working with cloud, where you are having to have everything function effectively in a variety of different uh, platforms that what people are seeing as most valuable right now is exactly that which does not have interoperability. Inter interoperability makes things a lot harder, particularly when you think yeah. of photorealistic avatars that look and sound like you and can fool a human being into thinking, yes, I'm talking to Scott. The idea of interoperability is kind of terrifying. And one of the reason, one of the ways that I can think of to do it is that it has to be some sort of web 3.0 sort of authentication. Otherwise it exists only on our servers, and if we ever put it on your own hardware, we have to worry about hacking and identity and deep fakes. Mm -hmm. It's just the only way I can figure out how to how to do it. But we've got a lot of smart people. The reason we have an MMO, none of the information about your character, your items are on your computer. It's all up there at the servers. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Joe. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, data science, data analyst kind of guy, but also uh, aspiring creative type. Right. So uh, what is the state of the EULAs, uh, the state of the legal um, situation today if I go to like a sandbox or digital world, whatever those you know, places are where you buy your property? Let's say I want to use it as a test bed for a board game I want to create in the physical world. So I put it out there in the digital world and have play testers, whatever, see how it goes in that space. Do I lose my copyright because it's now out there? Um, or do I always maintain 100% of it? You know, not so much what could the legal thing be tomorrow, but what is it today, if I wanted to do that today? What does your contract say? I'm asking, what is it? What is <laughs> it? I don't know what your contract says. That's what I'm saying. you got to read it. you got to read it. Everybody's got a different one. I mean, there are a lot of standard terms. You might read 30 EULAs and find a lot of the same general language in them because all of us lawyers will steal from each other. But the the question of whether I am trying to own your IP or I'm trying to allow for free creativity or I'm trying to, the, the, it really depends on what the, 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 wherever you're, wherever you're playing is going to be a different answer. And it's no different in the real world, right? The answer of what is the law in Georgia is different than what is the law in Florida or Tennessee or Alabama. You, you have to look at where you are, but the, un, unlike the laws of Florida or Tennessee or Alabama, where you've got reams and reams and reams of, of, of law books, the answer is very clearly in the little section marked terms of service, and you click on there and you read it. You might not understand it, you might need to hire a guy like me to read it, but for the most part, it's going to say what you can and can't do and what they do and do, don't do take ownership of. That's all governed by contract, and it has to be governed by contract because there's no generalized law. Again, the law is obviously if you create a copyright of a work, you own the copyright in the work. What happens to that work next depends on what the, the, the terms of where you're using it, where you're publishing it, where you're playing it are going to come in. So you own the copyright unless you don't is the answer. And the only way to know if unless you don't exists is click on the part that says terms of service and read through it very carefully. So the monkeys just created their area and rolled out their own crypto, right? Uh, the, everyone's favorite NFT monkeys have uh, decided they're going to be the landowners now. And one of the things that they pushed with their new environment was that it was a place for creators. Mm -hmm. But I have not read the EULA, so I've got no idea if really I do keep everything that I make within their environment. Certainly that's the way it's been promoted. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I spend a lot of time arguing with lawyers, uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty much most of my day arguing with lawyers. And I'll tell you, some of this we're still working out that we don't really know not only what it is going to be, but what it should be. And it gets complicated really, really fast. Let's say you come into, we have Horizon Worlds, and let's say you want to create a some kind of a shirt that or some kind of skin or something that identifies your world that you've created and you want to sell it to people. So you can sell it to people. We created a marketplace and we take a cut and you can sell it to people and you can make money off of it. However, we still, in the way the world works today, we are still the ones who own the ones and zeros that make it appear on your avatar on your headset. And they are still connected back to you that they came from you. 
And you could revoke ownership, you could update it, you could change the information, you could say you haven't paid your rent and I'm gonna change it from like, go Braves to Braves suck. And we are technically the ones who are controlling it to be able to show on somebody else's screen, but you are the one who's own it. And so we're working through trying to figure out how do you write that contract? How does that make sense? What role do we have in it? And if you bought it, do you really even own it? We actually do want you to be able to maintain some kind of an update to be able to fix things as we update new versions to make sure that it appears and renders correctly in your world. Most software needs to be updated from time to time or it gets outdated. But what is the relationship between you two when I'm the one who's actually owning the ones and zeros that makes it all happen? We are actively yep. arguing about this yep. with our we have an entire policy and legal team who are arguing about this day and night, and I tell you, we, we still don't know. So a lot of it is going to evolve over time as what seems right. We can take what seems to make sense from the world today and apply it as best we can, but once it goes out into the world and people start having conflicts, it's going to evolve, and yeah. we're going to figure that out. And the reason why we have so much law today is we've had a lot of conflicts and a lot of experience to figure it out. So one of the things I like to say to the lawyers is the law is probably not going to be how we figure this out. It's going to be people figure out what feels right, what norms should be. They're going to vote with their feet. They're going to go to platforms. They're going to go where it makes sense. They're not going to create on platforms that lock in and claim that they own your IP. And we're going to figure it out over time. And that is kind of scary to the lawyers, but really exciting for people like me who want to see what happens. And, so, and to build on that, uh, to keep one eye on whatever Epic does. So they created the Epic Store, and you can buy things to make in your games, and you have rights to that, but the creators have certain rights that are established. But at some point, this is going to roll into Fortnite. So right now, anything you buy in Fortnite is Epic created. And if that stuff is licensed looking, when you buy your Deadpool, yes, they're giving a cut to Marvel, but what they've created in there is, is owned by Epic. But, but they to want. To tie back to the name of the panel, that's why digital ownership is so important. Right. That if it's they owned by Epic and in it. Epic, how do you ever take your creation out of Epic? Right. So that is the goal, or so I have been told by folks up there, that the marketplace is going to start expanding more and more throughout what they're doing. So what you can buy in the marketplace right now, you can use for your own creations, eventually is going to go into something bigger. So that's what I'm saying. Keep an eye on what Epic does as they move into a line more and more. I mean, because they've been one of the most successful groups for user-generated content, even though it's not going to their own subjects. That marketplace is incredible. So, yeah, just it is not settled exactly to Nathan's point, but keep an eye on how that evolves. So sorry, go ahead. Hello, um, I have a question about digital real estate. Um, I have been reading articles um, that are basically read like horror novels of people getting their digital real estate stolen right from under them. In theory, I think it should be safe because it's on the blockchain and you can prove ownership and you can see it move. But apparently people get hacked and you know, they don't have the only answer from the articles that I've read is, get two-factor authentication and make sure your space is safe so um which makes me very nervous um so where are we in terms of the law you know if any because it feels like the wild wild west right if someone just comes and steals your land you can prove who stole it and where it's going and how it's being bought and sold and where we are in terms of any enforcement towards the future in these spaces so it, for, for personal security if you're interested in protecting your digital assets i highly recommend a podcast called darknet diaries um talks a lot about how people are making money by stealing with mm. digital currencies and digital real estate it is extremely profitable for for thieves and con artists and also nation states north korea is literally mm. robbing people now here's the it, here's the reality right from a legal perspective Again, we have centuries and centuries and centuries of law dealing with real property. But you know what doesn't happen? No one shows up with a bulldozer and pulls all your land out of the earth and pulls it somewhere else. Your property as stays long as your title's is. good. Right. <laughs> I might take you out, but that land's going to sit right there. Right? Your, your, your property is never going to leave where that property is. Unless global warming puts it underwater. But the, 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 the question of what do we do when digital property isn't where we think it ought to be. 
Well, anyway, it's a different question. Now, what you have, again, is theft of an asset. And you can pursue that as theft of an asset. What do you do to prove it's your asset? Obviously, you have blockchain, but if it got hacked, how do you how do you prove you didn't make a transfer? These are the things that you're going to have to dig into, you know, very fact specific. But it's going to be it's going to be theft of an asset, and you can sue for the theft of an asset, the damage it has caused you. But just like any other lawsuit that I would bring to prove that someone, you know, has has taken something from you of value, or has breached a contract, or has otherwise, uh, you know, caused you some harm, we have to prove all that. We have to have evidence to prove what happened and where it happened and how it happened, and 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 then we get it back. And all of that takes a lot of time and and a lot of money and a lot of effort. And people can defraud your title of your real property and, you know, go sell your real property to someone in Nebraska, and I have to go through the same hoops of proving that that deed was fraudulent and that signature is forged and all of that exists. But again, people... We, we have a better idea of what that is, right? You're dealing with people who all understand what a deed is and what, a, what and what land is. And when you're in front of a judge who who is you know 70 years old and 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 thinks of computers as things his grandson uses, we're dealing with you know a whole different uh, a whole different animal. So it's just a matter of you have the rights, but you're going to have to prove those rights. You're going to have to protect those rights. And digital property is just that much more fluid and mobile I, I can't no one in north korea is stealing your home lot <laughs> i hope <laughs> and I, I find myself in a weird position to be sort of the defend the one defending digital ownership of uh, digital property uh but 95 percent of the digital ownership and nfts have as far as we know gone where they've been supposed to go and stayed mm-hmm. where they're supposed to go and ownership has gone correctly with them and there have been some really grotesque obvi- and well-known violations of that but for the most part it's doing what people want it to do mm-hmm. i mean it's not going up in value like they want it to do necessarily but they still own whatever value it has mm-hmm. uh, so buyer beware oh. though yeah, d- yeah, d- yeah. digital digital land is only as valuable as you want it to be right. Right. i can own myspace.com slash nathan white and it's worthless today you could also get nice space or your space or infinite numbers it's only rare because who's ever selling it says it's rare there's in addition to theft and it is more of cryptocurrency that's being stolen than yeah. than nfts or real estate but there's also just scams of people right. pump it up and say yeah. hey this is value you hear about all these things if somebody sold an nft for some crazy amount of money what you don't know is they're probably selling it to themselves back and forth yeah. to hype up the number and then they sell one to some sucker who didn't realize that twenty four thousand of them were sold to their friends and they sell one to you for 10 million and they just took your money and yeah you bought it for 10 million you own it for 10 million is it worth 10 million well, if you can resell it to somebody. And he's a Snoop Dogg example. This isn't even a fraud. If Snoop Dogg suddenly decides that's not his property, your property next to him has dropped all its value. Mm-hmm. So please correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure I'm wrong, in defining um, to to help us understand. Web3, uh, the NFTs, blockchain, crypto, and now the metaverse, I thought the point was decentralization. But once you bring in meta attorneys doesn't that centralize things and protection for your assets does isn't that create a central control please explain i might get in trouble um (laughs) uh, they can be decentralized but there are still choke points if you have cryptocurrency, you have to put them somewhere. You have to put them in a wallet somewhere. You have to trade them on a platform somewhere. There are systems in place for that. Right now, you could call that decentralized because it's not the Federal Reserve, but it's still a choke point where somebody is controlling it and somebody has access to it. What's exciting is maybe they're new. Maybe they're new to the financial system. Maybe there's new ways to expand the financial system. And maybe there's ways to, over time, break through the financial system. But what we're seeing in a lot of cases is the more people put into crypto assets, the more they actually do want regulatory structure. They do want a central bank to say, no, 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 that's not your money, send it back. Or, oh, you accidentally wired that to the wrong person, send it back. Um, So the, the decentralization of, like, 
yes, there is decentralized in that they are decentralized from the power structures that exist today, but they're not decentralized in that there's really no power structures whatsoever. But don't we want well, no. do you? Know? <laughs> do you? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, well, do, let, let's go back to the question before you. What What do you do if you have a completely decentralized uh, system, and and you get hacked, make a mistake, click a wrong button, and send everything you own to some random guy in North not, Korea? Not, not even. What do you do about it? You make you, a mistake. You've got the benefit of being of being decentralized. It is You're, surprisingly yeah. easy to yeah. steal cryptocurrency from right. people, especially yeah. if you have a lot of it. It's really easy to find oh, yeah, out so. you have a lot of it. And then it's surprisingly easy to hack individuals. You probably have your code somewhere in an email address. Mm -hmm. I bet you use your same passwords all over the place. I bet you use the same email address for your bank accounts and your crypto accounts. And you know what? You don't even have to screw up for me to get your account. With two-factor authentication, one of the biggest scams right now, you can literally run into a T-Mobile office. The manager has a as a tablet that is specifically designed to be able to change phone numbers to people and it takes about 15 minutes for the company to rewire and disable that. Run in, grab it, and I can resell every phone number that I can get through on that network as fast as I can go in 15 minutes. People are doing this and stealing hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. What is difficult is it's actually kind of hard to cash out that much money because there are choke points where you can't get that much money and those choke points are where people get their money back and they're really grateful that they exist. So it's, it's not just you can right. make a mistake, it's that it's surprisingly easy to steal even if you have pretty good OPSEC. Yeah, I started with that. That's it, I mean, that's the, the hey, think about what would happen. You're, you're here at DragonCon. You're, you're, you've got tens of thousands of people out there you lose your credit card, you find out somebody else is using your credit card number, what's the first thing you do? You pick up your phone, you call whoever your credit card provider is, and you say, hello, Chase, turn off my credit card. Uh, by the way, that wasn't my charge. Please charge that back and don't make me pay for it. Yeah. You lose your bank card, you do the exact same thing. Somebody hits your bank account and steals $15,000, you say, hey, I didn't make that transfer. Put my money back in, and FDIC insurance takes care of that because we put regulatory systems over banks to do exactly the thing that you're going to want to do when your money goes away. So everybody thinks they want anarchy. I think I want anarchy, but I really like my comfortable life where I can make a phone call and say, <laughs> Chase, fix my problem, and my problem is fixed. You know, so, who, you know who does like that you can't get your money back? Hackers, yeah. people who are stealing your information. <laughs> right. That's why when people hijack and lock your equipment, the um, ransomware. ransomware. That's a, that's how ransomware is making money and ransomware mm -hmm. is blowing up, is that you can give me that money and you can't get it back. I can hide it, I can move it around, I can put it into a tumbler so I can get small amounts of money out and you can't get it back. Thieves like decentralization, drug dealers like decentralization, and yeah, maybe that's good in the grand scheme of things that we don't rely on governments and large national, international institutions like Chase to provide that security, but if they're not Chase and they're not the Federal Reserve, most people still do want some kind of system with their money. Well, I thought decentralization was one of those um, points of the dream of Web3. All along is... Us so, our own, own money, our own wallet, our own access. So you hit it right. The idea of the dream, creative, creative versus practical. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and 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 I deal with this all the time because I work with creative people, right? I deal with programmers, I deal with artists, I deal with, and and, and the creative people aren't necessarily good business people. <laughs> and, 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 and I don't mean that to be offensive. I'm a lawyer. I'm a terrible business person. If I knew how to run a business, I'd run a business. Instead, I tell businesses to just give me money to yell at them. <laughs> but the, the 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 reality is that there are lots of things that sound like they'll be great, that sound like this is our way to a utopia. Until you get to that utopia and realize that now you're broke, naked, and bleeding, and you don't know why, and you don't know how to fix it, <laughs> because every other all the other systems went away. And a lot so, of this you won't even have without the centralization of it. You won't have digital real estate without someone saying this is real estate mm -hmm. i have created this real estate it's in my setting you may now in, in interact with the real estate i have created so uh most of this won't exist without us mm -hmm. without yeah centralized groups creating it yeah i mean I, again I, I think there's some real merit to the idea of more democratic creation 
more democratic regulation, not controlled by any single government, not controlled by any single corporation. But I, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, if, if you don't have something, then you don't really have. At the end of the day, we live and die by terms of service. Right. Right. <laughs> there, there's also the, the difference of, you know, a hundred years from now, the world and society is going to look very different, and it might be where that's the norm, and there are new institutions, and it makes sense, and it works out that way. Is that likely in the next five years? Yeah. And, I, well, I'm I mean, not gambling on it. A lot of a lot of early cyberpunk writers sort of uh, postulated that we would have the World Wide Web where you could create your own address and you create your own building in that address and people could walk to your address virtually from their address virtually. But that's not how it's coming. That's actually right what now. I was thinking. Anybody can set up their own email server. You anybody can set up their own email server, but almost nobody does because it's hard and it's a pain in the ass. And Gmail works. <laughs> <laughs> and. Unfortunately, it's probably less hackable than most email servers people set up. And <laughs> you've got that a email. powerful corporation with a lot of incentive to make sure that it doesn't get hacked, to make it, to regularly update it, to regularly make sure it's secure. It's actually kind of nice to have a corporation do it. Google wants to make you. sure nobody has your information except Google. <laughs> well, so, you know, this isn't a privacy one, but that that's actually an interesting development in privacy rules. So I, I am a privacy advocate. This is how I ended up at Meta, that we... We are getting into a world where as long as you do not transfer data to a third company that you do not own, it's not tracking. That on Apple, you've got that ask not to track. They define tracking as sharing information to another corporation. So everything you do on Apple is not tracked because it's Apple. As long as they don't share it with Facebook or Google, they can share it with iTunes, they can share it with Mac, they can share it with any blah, 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 which is really interesting when you look at Amazon buying up banks, buying up grocery stores, buying up Roomba, buying up medical providers, that as long as it's owned by the same corporate entity, it's not considered tracking as long as they don't share it to anybody else. Oh, yeah, I read those cyberpunk books, too. <laughs> And actually, so this is something I did want to talk about on this panel, which is digital ownership of IP, because this is something we're going to see more and more of. And I mean, data is one very important thing already up uh, that is digitally owned in many places. And frankly, I know there are folks in Roblox who are tracking the folks who come into their places, getting information about everyone who comes to their environment and uses that for marketing at that point. And they own that data and they could go around and sell it legally by the U.S. to other groups. Uh, and share it. So I guess maybe as long as it's not in Europe. <laughs> um, but uh, it is interesting to see how people are gathering data within their own little bits of the metaverse and getting value from that, and they are considering themselves to own that data. So we see all the headlines of millions of dollars for digital real estate, but there's so many other things being owned theoretically in the metaverse that people care about. That we've had the sale in MMOs of your avatars and your items for decades now. I mean, EverQuest, the first EverQuest back in the 90s, people were making good livings, uh, farming stuff at that point, selling, building up an avatar and selling it, selling rare items and so forth. And we're still seeing that now. We're still seeing a thriving market selling skins in games, uh, from, from one person to another. So the, I, the idea of what you can own in the metaverse goes well beyond real estate. And it's something we have to consider for a long time. And I love what TJ talked about, about lawyers stealing each other's uh, contracts and slapping stuff in there. Because now we're talking about NFT contracts, and you're going to see stuff out of that stolen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But TJ, I'm sure you can tell us some interesting stories. I, IP laws are incredibly powerful. That They trump other considerations a lot of the time. For example, we build interesting things with Disney's IP, and we have the rights to do that in certain jurisdictions, but not others. So we don't necessarily want to track and know where you are, but we're legally required to know if you're in Germany versus Canada, because we can't show it to you if you're in Germany. And we build all these systems to try to anonymize of, we don't actually want to know you're in Germany, we're trying to respect your privacy, but for this one instance, we actually do need to know because Disney actually owns this, not us. Uh, so that's interesting that we developed those systems. So when you talk about like you're building something with Roblox or uh, let's say Minecraft, it's a block. 
you put five blocks together and now it looks like a castle. What does the contract say? Who owns that? If you bring that castle into somewhere else. Roblox, you've got the concept of a game and you can't export it anywhere else. If you rebuild that game somewhere else, is Roblox going to come after you? The IP is really interesting. Also requires weird amounts of tracking and that, that example where I said you're selling a t-shirt, or you moved, you're selling a t-shirt <laughs> to, to you, who actually owns it? If you sell a t-shirt that has the Washington football team, no problem. That's not copyrighted. If you sell a t-shirt that says the Atlanta Braves, that is copyrighted. And if Atlanta Braves want to come after us, they're probably not coming after you. You probably don't have that much money. They're probably not coming after you because, hey, you like the Braves. That's cool. They don't want to mess with their fans. <laughs> they're coming after me. And so we have to build into that system of how do we manage these rights. And that is well-established law. So that's an interesting area where we just actually do have law that we pretty much have to follow and build around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are these are some of the laws that we've had for decades and decades, right? Intellectual property laws are written into the Constitution, and beyond that, we we got them in our Constitution from older laws in in in, in Europe. So the, the the idea of intellectual property is 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 well established and well defined, and and has very clear rules, as clear as any legal rule can be, anyway. But uh, again. In a lot of instances, the question of what can you do with that intellectual property is, what does the contract say? What is your license agreement? Can you show it in Germany? No, it's not in your license. Can't. So it's it, it this this whole area really does come down to what you are agreeing to with either the guy across the street from you in your real or virtual land, or with the probably giant company that owns your virtual land and what you've done there. So so I just realized we're actually at time. So let's take another question and do final final thoughts so we can make sure that we get ready for the next next group. Okay, so keeping it quick, um, in the next, let's say, 10 years, do you see um, the possibility of the defragmentation of the metaverse since it's more so a combination of physical, hardware, also digital software, and is metaverse is defined as all things digital, uh, effectively. <laughs> I mean, so that you own, that it can be owned, like NFTs or crypto. Do you see a defragmentation of that? Because it's the defragmentation defrag meaning big companies owning chunks of it, right? Like almost like countries. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm worried about that in the internet today. Uh, the data localization laws that we're seeing all around the world are really troubling. The World Wide Web works because data goes everywhere. It's a network. You can send packets and the system will find where they need to go to. As soon as you start getting into data localization and you start to say this data can only exist here, then the internet starts to fragment and you start to build <coughs> splinternet. And there are good reasons for that. There's lawsuits that Europeans don't want to send data into the United States because we have a lot of surveillance here. We're really good at digital surveillance in the United States. And they don't want to be a part of that. India wants to make sure that their data is there. On the flip side, the U.S. government's really worried about TikTok and wants Americans' data about TikTok not to go over to China. And so TikTok is pretty federated. Most of their uh, national or their international companies are based as a federation of national versions. So the American TikTok is very different than the Brazilian TikTok. They run essentially as a, a separate company. That's happening today. <coughs> and already you have companies that own war large swaths of the internet. I can't do a FaceTime between WhatsApp and iMessage. Those systems are just completely incompatible. So I, I think with the metaverse and the intentionality of building something new and desire for interoperability, there's a chance that we might be able to address that current threat, but it is a, a major threat to the internet today. And the other thing that limits the, that will create more defragmentization and less fragmentization is the money. As more and more value comes into this, bigger and bigger and bigger entities come into the space. And uh, where there's money, there's going to be more, more right. centralized. Control. All right, I think we're getting the hook. So quickly, TJ, final thoughts. What's the contract say? <laughs> <laughs> really, really trolling for work. Huh? <laughs> no, T TJ can read. We've established that. So if, if you need somebody. Final, final thoughts, Andy. There is some actual value to a lot of these things. I'll, again, point to Roblox. People are making good money, creating really cool things up there. Uh, you just have to expand what you think of as what is your digital ownership. But, again, the question is, can someone pull the plug on you at some point? My final thought, if we all survive and we all get along, the next 10 years of computing are going to be really, really interesting.
All right. Thank you.